Today we're continuing our sermon series called The Comeback. And last week I talked about how Jesus rising from the dead was the greatest comeback in history. Today we are talking about Job making a comeback. And Job makes a comeback from undeserved suffering in life. And that is the key phrase that we want to focus on today is undeserved suffering. Why does God allow us to suffer? Not a really easy question to answer, is it? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond when the trials and tribulations that we are going through are unmerited? They're not our fault. We're going to look at the book of Job this morning, and hopefully we're going to gain a little bit of clarity together as to how we can make it through and come back from suffering. The Hebrew name Job literally means persecuted one. Did you know that? That's like his name means persecuted one. And Job was a good case. And it always amazes me to give an example of this is how many people choose to be stuck. Okay, we've got two hands that I've seen here. When this happens, the struggle that ensues is a direct result of our stupidity, right? So the tow driver that has to get called and the money that we got to pay for that, anything that we got to go to the mechanic for to fix the car, to vacuum it out, get it cleaned up, to get it dried out, all of that, All of the suffering and the pain and the inconvenience and everything that we go through, that is a direct result of us. So there are also times, so that's one reason why we suffer. There's also times in life when our suffering is a direct result of God's discipline in our life. Now, the consequences might not be directly connected to our behavior and what we did in the moment, but there are times, the Bible says this, that God can choose to administer discipline on us for our disobedience. In the Bible, we see that Israel tried to go up against Ai after the battle of Jericho, because, and then they were defeated because of Achan's sin. He took things He took plunder that he shouldn't have taken. We see in scripture that King David coerced Bathsheba into having sex with him. And then he had he had her husband killed on the battlefield. And God's discipline was to take the life of his firstborn son born to Bathsheba. Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament sold a plot of land And they came and they lied, saying, here is all the money from the land. And they donated that to the church, but they lied about it because they held money back. And the Holy Spirit struck them dead. Saul, we see, is struck blind on the road to Damascus because of his persecution of Christians. Now, I want to be really careful here as I'm talking about this. I'm giving you a few biblical examples, but we need to be extremely careful in how we interpret events in life and say this is God's judgment, this is God's punishment, and this is God's discipline. We need to be very careful about how we uh, make calls in life. And in fact, I've seen way too many assumptions made, too many problems arising in church too many unhealthy cultures happening in church because there's a lot of talk of judgment like well you're struggling in life you're this is because this is a result of sin or like i don't want to when we look at scripture whenever god does something discipline like there's always really strong prophetic warning or explanation or interpretation for what god is doing and why god is doing it so i want to make that really clear But I I don't want to gloss over the point that sometimes we do suffer and people have suffered because God is bringing discipline. When Job suffered, as Terry read for us today and we heard, it could be a job loss. It could be traumatic events, abuse, bullying, disabilities, hunger, poverty, 
death of loved ones, or any other kind of physical, mental, emotional, social, or psychological struggle, many times we are like Job. We are facing a suffering that is undeserved in our life. And this is the type of suffering, if we were to be honest, is what drives many of us away from God. It becomes a real stumbling block for us because when we are going through these circumstances and these trials, we get really frustrated because we're like, this is not our fault. I did not ask for this. I am living a good life. I'm trying really hard. I'm trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to make good de decisions and good choices, but yet this is now coming my way. What do I do with this? It is the unfairness of it all. It is the injustice of it all that makes us begin to question, is God real? Is God truly who, we say, who he says that he is? Can I really trust this God? Does this God really care about me? Is the Bible even really true? Or is it all just made up nonsense? Because how can a God who says that he loves me allow me to suffer? Look at Job 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. This does not sound like the type of man that should be suffering. But God allows Satan to test righteous Job and bring extreme suffering into his life. And I know that this is extremely difficult to acknowledge and accept. And I don't have a lot of really easy, clear answers for us. And I'm going to try to be a little bit more clear as we get to the third point of my message. I only have 18 points today. So once we get to the third point, I'll try to clarify a little bit more this idea of why does God allow suffering to happen, especially to good people. See, the thing is, is that sin is part of the equation in the world. Sin is here. It's operating. It's part of the mix. And we can do our best to honor God, to love him. But you and I cannot avoid being impacted by the power of sin. Maybe it's a drunk driver. Maybe it's an abusive parent. Maybe it's a manipulative boss. Maybe it's a drive-by shooter. Maybe it's a corporation that dumps toxic chemicals into drinking water and we get sick. Maybe it's a corrupt government that doesn't know how to administer justice well. Maybe it's somebody who stole our identity online. Whatever it is, sin is operating in the world, in people, in systems, you know, just, and we're going to talk about this a little bit deeper when I get to my third point, but we cannot avoid sin impacting our life, even if we are good, decent, God-fearing people. So if this is the reality that we face, what are we to do about it? We heard and we read earlier today that the Sabaeans took Job's oxen and donkeys, they ki he killed his servants, the Chaldeans took the camels, killing all the servants. Fire came out of heaven, destroyed all of Job's sheep and the servants with him. A mighty wind came out of the desert, blew down the house where all of Job's children were at, killing every one of his kids. Chapter 2, if we read further, shows that Satan afflicts Job with painful sores all over his body. So in an instant, Job loses his wealth. He loses his servants. It's next or what's left. Maybe the undeserved suffering that you're going through is fresh and new. Maybe you've just gotten a medical diagnosis that's not good. Maybe you've had a miscarriage. Maybe your whole department at work has just been laid off without warning. Maybe you've just realized that your spouse was having an affair and now the marriage is ending. Whatever it is, I am sure that we are familiar with doing our best to live life, do things the right way. We're not trying to be evil people, but then all of a sudden these things are coming out and coming at us and it feels like maybe one thing after another. And it's just like Job where the enemy is swooping in, the fire is coming down from heaven, the winds are coming out of the desert, and it feels like our world is being torn apart. Listen to what this woman 
writes, I don't even know who this woman was, but I found this. And she said, while my husband Frank and I were living in Pakistan many years ago, our six-month-old baby died. An old Punjabi who heard of our grief came to comfort us, and he said this. A tragedy like this, which is undeserved suffering, is similar to being plunged into boiling water. And then he went on to explain. If you are an egg, your affliction will make you hard-boiled and unresponsive. If you are a potato, you will emerge soft, pliable, resilient, and adaptable. It may sound funny to God, but there have been many times where I've prayed, Lord, let me be a potato. <laughs> Just like Job, you and I are going to be able to come back from suffering. But our comeback is dependent on how we're going to walk through it. And when I say a comeback, I want to be very clear this morning that the comeback in this context probably looks like make like coming out the other side of our suffering, bruised, broken, but more humble and more compassionate and empathetic for others. It probably means to make a comeback from suffering is to come out the other side a little bit more Christ-like in our life. We can choose to go through our pain as an egg or as a potato. One of us would emerge hardened, jaded, angry, bitter, and lacking faith. But the other would emerge tender, soft, compassionate, faith-filled, and more spiritually mature. Job did not allow the circumstances in his life to let him become brittle, cynical, and accusatory. Job never blamed God and never walked away from him. In fact, Job allowed his circumstances to refine him, purify him, humble him, and make him more dependent upon God. And that is why Job was able to come back and to come out. And I'm going to talk about four things that Job did that we're going to see in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and say if we can model and learn from Job's life, and if we can adopt in us the same mindset, the same attitude, and the same behaviors, we will be on the right path. It, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. I'm not talking about quick fixes here in our life, but we will emerge. There will be light at the end of the tunnel, and God will bring us through and honor us for these behaviors and for us to walk through our suffering in this way. Are you ready to hear the four things that Job did? Okay. In the midst of our undeserved suffering, the first thing that Job did and that we have to do is we have to become a mourner. Let's look at Job chapter 1, verse 20. Everything I'm going to share with you today, I'm just going to pull right out of the text. I'm not trying to give you my advice. I'm not going to try to tell you what I think is the right thing to do. I'm giving you straight up what we see scripture telling us today. Job 120, it says this, at this, so this is right after what Terry had just read this morning of everything that he went through. Job had just found out about all of the devastation and all of the pain and all the suffering, and it says this, Job got up, he tore his robe, and he shaved his head. Now, this sounds a little bit weird, right? Tearing our clothes and shaving our head. What does this have to do with me making it through the suffering and the trials that I'm going through? Jeremy, are you going to tell me right now to just rip my clothes off? I've, there's shavers under the seats right now. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> In ancient Hebrew culture, tearing one's clothes was a public way. And public is the key word here. It was a public way of expressing grief. And you will still see this exact same public expression happening in Jewish life today. It's become more ritualized, and it's called the kariah. I don't know if I'm saying that word, but let's just go ahead and say that it's called kariah. But you would go potentially to a funeral 
where a Jewish family has lost a loved one, and there will be a ceremony, more than likely, of somebody cutting a ribbon or cutting fabric on their clothes to signify this public expression of anguish and grief. In the book of Genesis, Jacob was told that his son Joseph was killed. Now, this was a lie, but he believed it. What does he do? He tears his clothes and he mourns the loss of his son. And Job not only tears his clothes, but he shaves his head, which is another visible public sign of heartbreak and sadness. And it was really important for Job to let the grief out, to mourn, and to just express this. Sadly, many of us, myself included, have experienced church as a place where mourning is not appropriate. Can anyone agree with me and hear me on this, right? Because church is a place where we have to have it all together, or at least act like we have it all together. And one of my biggest fears as the planting pastor of Uptown Church is that that spirit and that culture would infect this place to where everyone feels like they got to walk in the door, plaster that smile on, and act like everything's okay in my life. That is terrible. We never want that to be the case here at Uptown Church. We want to be a community where you can come in the door and rip your clothes and shave your head. Metaphorically. Please, metaphorically. (laughs) But growing up for me, it was like to express doubt or to be frustrated or to acknowledge what we were going through, it was almost, it was deemed a lack of faith. And I was told, Jeremy, you got to have better faith. There's a problem with you because your faith isn't strong enough because you want to express your pain, your grief, your mourning, and your anguish. I'm here to tell you that that is not biblical, that is not godly, and the book of Job tells us that we need to let it out. We need to express it. We need to be able to walk in the doors and say, everything is not fine here. And there needs to be a community of people that will come around us and say, that's okay that everything's not fine. I'm here for you. What can I do for you? Now, not to always put the blame on the spiritual community. Sometimes we are the problem. Because sometimes for us, expressing grief, sadness, these are difficult emotions and they're uncomfortable for us, so we just want to hide them. It's not that the community is messed up. The community might be, the church might welcome that. We here at Uptown Church might be like, no, express, you know, you can, you can let us know. You can be authentic, and you can be real. You can get frustrated. You can, but then we're like, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And then we hide because we're not wanting to be vulnerable. Although the climate is welcoming that vulnerability. Do you know what I'm talking about? So we can't always just assume that it's the culture or the people. Sometimes it's us. And we have to be willing to get awkward. (laughs) Sometimes church just needs to be an awkward place. What I love about Uptown Church is that we're not really concerned about being super polished and super professional in everything that we do. Sometimes... You can go to a church building and it's like everything is down. Like, you know, like, you, you know what I'm talking about where it's like the, the service is beautiful, right? And it's seamless and everything is just, but there's something communicated in that, that we have to be beautiful, that we have to be seamless. Sometimes it's okay for church to be clunky and awkward because that speaks to me that I can be clunky and awkward and I can express some of this junk that's going on in my life. Whatever the case may be. If you and I want to get through our undeserved suffering, we got to learn to mourn. We have to learn to grieve. And this is the first thing that Job does, is he learns how to pour out his heart, his grief, and his sadness. But it doesn't stop there. That's the first thing that Job does. The second thing that Job does, it says that he became a worshiper. So not only do we want to become a mourner, in the midst of our undeserved suffering, we need to worship. Job 1, 20, verses 20, uh, chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. The next thing that Job does, it says he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, 
and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. We sang the song, Blessed Be Your Name, today, which I requested the worship team to do because that song was written out of this passage. So when we sing that song, we are worshiping in the style of Job. And what does Job do with his worship? There's three things that I see here in his worship. His worship is filled with humility. His worship is filled with surrender. And his worship is filled with adoration. So the humility, he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. There's this frailty and there's this humility in that phrase. The second thing he does is he says, the Lord gave and the Lord t- took away. He's surrendering and saying, I don't have any control here. He accepts the fact that he doesn't have total control of his life. Now, most of what, that is who he is. It is his lifestyle. It's in his DNA. It's second nature to him. So in the good times, when things are going great for Job, Job worshiped. And now in the bad times, he's doing the exact same thing. Think of David, David, the most prolific writer of our Psalms, who was the probably the best worship leader Israel ever had. He wrote a lot of music while he was out tending his father's sheep. He didn't write these songs only when Saul was chasing him, but he worshiped God in the field when he was when everything was semi okay. Obviously, some animals came out to try to attack the sheep from time to time. But David was a worshiper before he ever became anointed king and before Saul ever chased him. And whenever Saul began to chase him and David's life began to get hunted and things started to get chaotic, David just continued to do what he had always done, which was to be a worshiper. We fall into trouble because when suffering isn't really present in our life, and things are semi in our control, and things are sort of going okay, our worship is sort of lacking. And we're not developing the muscle of becoming lifestyle worshipers of Jesus. In the good times, we need to develop passionate, hungry, sold-out worship to God, adoration, praise. Everything belongs to him. We give it to him. We're not lackluster. We're not lackadaisical. We're not complacent. But the problem is, is that we get complacent. Lifestyle worshiper of Jesus prepares us for the moment of suffering so that when suffering comes, we don't skip a beat. We don't lose a beat. We have been fortified in our souls. We have been fortified in our spirits, and we are still able to lift the name of the Lord on high. So the first thing that happens if our worship life is anemic, we just sort of stop worshiping. And then the second thing that potentially can happen is we become what I would call worship overdosers. What do do I mean by that? Well, all of a sudden, we think that, oh, life is getting challenging. I need to earn God, earn something from God to make him stop what's going on. So I'm going to become a fervent worshiper now in this moment. I'm going to now turn to God right now. I'm going to put worship music on all my devices. I'm going to like, I'm in the shower, I'm singing. You know what I'm saying? Like all of a sudden we're we're taking every moment to try to utilize worship as a tool and as a weapon to get us out of the situation that we're in. But that just makes us like the prophets of Baal. And if you remember the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, they were doing everything in their power to get their God to act on their behalf. And to the point where they were cutting themselves. They were screaming. Like they were like they were just like, God, move on our behalf. And when we utilize worship as a tool to get God to move on our behalf, now that we're suffering, it doesn't really work that way. God is looking for people that are just lifestyle worshipers of him. We worship him in the good, we worship him in the bad, and there is a faithfulness to us in the struggle. And I want to remind us, Job doesn't just mourn. He doesn't just worship. As I get to my third point here, Job becomes an exonerator. And this is a big word, but basically this means Job doesn't blame God. Often we have the wrong body part facing God. Too often we have our fingers pointed at him 
and God is wanting our eyes on him. You understand what I'm saying there? When we blame God, we are calling him cruel, unjust, imperfect, a liar. He's, we are claiming that he is not who the Bible says that he is. We have to learn to release God from blame. Now, I don't have simple answers for us this morning, and forgive me as I try to navigate this next section because these are very difficult philosophical things to talk about. Why does God allow suffering in the world? Because we can blame God for that and say, God, you do allow me to suffer because God allowed Job to suffer. Why does God allow it? This is one of those questions that a lot of us can never get over. I was questioning this a lot in my younger days. Why would God, if God was so good, why would he allow suffering? That was one thing that I would ask. The second question is if God defeated death, hell, and the grave, and sin on the cross, then why isn't suffering over? Let me offer a few things for us this morning. Does anybody else ask those types of questions, or, or am I sort of alone in this, right? Good, I'm glad. Here's the first thing I want us to remember when it comes to the relationship between God and our suffering. God is not the cause of our suffering. Sin is the cause of our suffering. This is really important. Sin manifests itself in the world of another individual. We talked about the drunk driver that hits a loved one and kills them, and now we are suffering because of the actions of that drunk driver. That was not God. That was an a individual allowing sin to operate through their life. Sin also manifests itself through broken systems in a more communal way. Think about, like, a justice system. Is our justice system here in America perfect? No. We've been talking about the reforms that we need to see. There are people that are falsely imprisoned, that are innocent. There are people that are given longer terms of sentence than other people based on the color of their skin or because of their financial situation and the influence and power that maybe a family member has in society. Sin can also operate through pure demonic powers and principalities. Like, we're, we don't really talk a lot about witchcraft, voodoo, like things like that, but it can manifest itself through these things. Possession. Sin can operate as a cosmic force in the world. Think about a hurricane that just comes in and ravages a community and Hundreds or thousands of people die. Is it the fact that God was sending judgment on that community and purposely sending a hurricane? Or is it that sin is operating in the world and our world is just not operating the way God designed it? So we live has defeated Satan and sin. But yet God has not fully set the world right yet. And this is a really hard concept. This has always been a really hard concept for me to understand and for me to just sort of accept but I want us to think about it. I heard it this weekend. Uh, Professor Max Lee um, at this conference that I was at was talking about suffering. I was really glad to hear him speak. But he talked about the game of chess. Does anyone here play the game of chess? Okay, so have you ever seen a game, or it could be checkers. Maybe you play checkers. There's a point in the game where you know that the one person has lost and the other person has won, but the game's not yet quite over yet. Do you know what I'm talking about? You realize that there is no way that this guy is coming back in like five or six moves, the queen is going to get knocked off, or there's going to be a bunch of jumps and checkers. Like, there's just like, there might be like, you've got eight pieces on the board, they've only got one piece on the board, but they still got the one piece. The game isn't over, but the game has been decided. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus made, God made the final move that has doomed Satan to complete and utter failure. The problem is, is that there's a couple of pieces still on the board, 
And the pieces are only going to get cleared off the board when God comes back and fully eradicates and creates a new creation. The old, you know what I'm saying? Book of Revelation talks about this, where there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That is going to be whenever the queen, the king gets knocked over. That's going to be the final checker piece that gets taken. But right now, you and I are able to look at the game board and see that Satan has lost. And that's what the resurrection of Jesus gives us. And we celebrate that. And we live into that. But we also know that we're still waiting for the final moves to be made to prove that the loss has happened. It's inevitable. And this is really critical for you and I if we are going to navigate suffering well. Is that we have to have the faith and the understanding that Satan has been defeated, but the board hasn't yet been cleared. Why has the board not yet been cleared? But why hasn't Jesus come back yet? That's exactly right. Revelation chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. There's a little bit of insight here as to why God is holding off on ending all suffering in the world. Because in order for God to end suffering in the world, it is going to take a complete new creation that needs to happen. We're talking like a total destruction and a total rebuild. And God says, I'm not yet ready to do it because I still want to see more people brought into the kingdom. There's no set number that God gives here in Revelation chapter 6 because the saints are groaning. How long, O Lord, until you make all things new and make all things right? And God gives like this cryptic answer that says, well, until the set number of people have come in and been brought into the fold like in in a crazy weird way the reason that you and i have to endure suffering is god's compassion for people because he wants to see people come to a saving knowledge of him so that they come into the kingdom so that when things are finally set right they are able to participate in the eternal life of what god brings so there is a compassion and a mercy and you and i have to accept the fact that it is god's compassion and mercy that in a way keeps us going through suffering because sin is still on the board in a way does that make sense Sin has been defeated, but it hasn't been finally defeated yet. And that is the period that you and I are living in. So that's the second thing I want to say about why we're suffering right now. God is not the cause. Sin's the cause. And we're living in this in-between time. And then the third thing that I want to say is that in his mercy, God uses our unfair, undeserved suffering for good. This is how God is operating in the world today. God is saying, I'm not quite ready to eradicate everything. I'm not quite ready to like end all the suffering. You're going to have to stick with it and feel the effects of sin right now. But what I will do for you is I will use it for your good. I will use it for other people's good. And I will use it for the good of the world and the good of society if you allow me to do it. So while you and I are living in this in-between season between the cross and the return of Jesus Christ, God is wanting to graciously and mercifully take what is meant for our harm, what is meant as evil against us, the unfairnesses of life, the pain of life, the injustices of life, and he wants to take it and use it and make something good in us and out of it in our life. Isn't that a beautiful thing that God is willing to do? This is what a comeback looks like if you and I are willing to submit to this and have faith that God wants to do this. When we allow, open ourselves up, so instead of blaming God, instead of pointing a finger at God, But instead, to open ourselves up and say, God, I am giving you permission and access to me to take this evil, awful, terrible thing and use it for your good and to use it for your glory. Lord, I surrender it all to you. I surrender everything about my life to you in this moment and say, take it and make magic, that miraculous work that you do out of love for me. I choose not to blame you. I choose to open myself up to you. 
not only can we need to ask the question, are we able to release God from blame? Are you and I able to release ourselves from blame? Because Satan is a manipulator and a deceiver. And he is going to wiggle his way into our lives and say, this is your fault. You're the reason why you're suffering. And he is trying to beat us down. He is trying to detract us. He is trying to detour us. And he is trying to tell us, you deserve what you're going through. But just how we don't want to blame God and just how we don't want to blame ourselves We want to be able to put the blame squarely where the blame belongs, and it belongs on sin, Satan, and evil that is happening in this world today. Is everybody with me still? Is everybody with me still? I'm going to see in chapter 2 is he becomes a discerner. So he mourns, he worships, he exonerates, and now he's a discerner. Let's look at verse 9 in chapter 2. It says, his wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. That's the advice that she gives. He replies, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? The last thing that I want to say here this morning is that when you and us, and maybe they've got good intentions and maybe they don't have good intentions, but there is going to be wisdom brought our way that we are going to have to be able to discern is what being told to me good advice or bad advice. Here in Job chapter 2, his wife offers an opinion and says, curse God and die. Was this good advice or bad advice? That's a pretty easy one, right? We can look at that and say, that doesn't sound right to me. But if we go through the rest of the book of Job, Job is in dialogue with a few of his friends, and the whole thing is a back and forth of the friends trying to convince Job uh, of of certain things, uh, whether it's Job's fault, but they're giving false advice, they're creating false explanations, and Job has to remain firm, steadfast, and strong and say, no, you guys are not speaking truth, I know what the truth is. Here's the thing that you and I need to figure out is that you and I can only discern well as we're going through pain. We can only discern well if we know God's word. There's no other way to figure this out. We have to know the Bible. We have to be immersed in scripture. Scripture has to be the light unto our feet. Wait, what is that? The lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We have to know what the Bible says so that whenever something comes, contradiction contrary to what scripture says comes our way in the form of maybe pleasant advice as we're suffering we know to reject it and we know to say "Uh uh-uh that's not right that's not good because scripture doesn't say it so if someone comes to us and says you know what you need to do right now in the midst of your suffering curse god and turn your back on him we know to reject it now let me Say once again, that's an easy one, but Satan likes to deceive us and he will come at us through people and with words and thoughts that look really helpful and sound really good. And they seem like it's the right path to get through our suffering. But let me tell you, it is not the right path for us. What is what happens to Jesus after his baptism? The Holy Spirit sends Jesus out into the wilderness for a time of testing from Satan. And he is weakened. He's hungry. He's out with the wild animals, the book of Mark says. That is not a pleasant experience for Jesus to spend 40 days out in the wilderness. And Satan comes at him to try to convince him of three different ways to make it through his suffering. And what it does, no, this is what the word of God says. You are a liar. What you have to offer me is not good. What you have to offer me is not right because I know what the word of God says. This is why we read. This is why we do our devotions. This is why we memorize scripture. This is why we soak ourselves in the word. We have to become people that know the Bible in and out to just be having those words part of our soul and part of our spirit because when suffering comes, it's going to matter. So if we don't know God's word well and we move into a season of suffering, some common unbiblical advice that we tend to gravitate to is things like, it's better for me to suffer in isolation than to suffer in community. Oh, that, 
I should isolate myself. Does God's word tell us to do that? No. Another um, biblical advice that we would buy into is we're like, oh, I'm going through financial hardship. I'll just stop giving to God. Does the Bible tell us to do that? No. Or if we're struggling and we're, we feel like we're weak and we feel like we're tired and we feel like we're beaten down, I just don't have to serve God. The Bible doesn't say these things. Another thing that we buy into is this idea that maybe grumbling, complaining, and gossiping about what I'm going through is going to help me because I'll feel better. Does the Bible say that we're grumbling, complaining, and gossiping is okay? No, it doesn't. Or finally, maybe we just sort of agree to this idea that selfish practices are justified, and I'll label them as self-care practices because I don't understand what Scripture really says about how I'm supposed to care for myself, so I'm going to come up with my own idea of what care looks like, and I'm going to try to implement that into my life. We have to know how to mourn. We have to know how to worship. We have to know how to uh, exonerate God, and we have to know how to discern. Undeserved suffering, as David comes up this morning, undeserved suffering has the potential to derail us and to pull us really far away from Jesus. And maybe it's happening to you this morning. Maybe you have found your way here to Uptown Church this morning, and you are really in the valley. You are going through the desert. And slowly but surely, your faith is eroding. I'm trying to admit to you this morning that I do not have all the answers. These are really difficult questions, and I'm trying to do my best to explain what I believe Scripture says here. But I can't make total sense out of these questions of why is God allowing suffering. But I do know that God is not the cause of our suffering. And he is willing to work good out of our lives and what we are going through if we allow him to do it. And that is how you and I make a comeback this morning. The question that I have for us this morning is for us to evaluate our lives and say, where am I at with mourning? Am I able to tear my clothes and shave my head? Am I able to express my sorrow and my sadness? Am I able to share my pain? Am I able, or, or am I uncomfortable with that? Am I choosing to live behind a mask of fake smiles and pleasant surface, surface interactions, thinking that I can somehow make a comeback a different way? What about with our worship? Are we living a lifestyle of worship, or are we using it as a tool to make God move on our behalf? Are you and I able to release God from blame? Can you trust that God is going to do something good with what you're going through? And how well do we know God's word? I'm sorry that I can't give you probably all the answers and the complete solutions that you're looking for this morning. But what I can offer and what I believe this church can offer is the ability to walk with you, to pray with you, to be there with you and to accept you in the midst of everything that you're going through. And also to encourage you and hold you accountable in these four areas, to be willing to ask the question, are you walking through your suffering the right way? I know that you, I believe, that each and every one of us are capable of making our way through the wilderness, coming out of the valley, coming out of the desert, because God is powerful enough to do it. And let's honor God with our lives and walk through it the way Job did. If you and I are prone to sulking, grumbling, blaming, and giving into unbiblical advice, I would imagine that you are hardening up like an egg right now. You are in the boiling waters of life, and you are becoming more bitter. You are becoming more cynical. But if you and I can become like that potato, and God is able to do it, it doesn't matter how far we think our hearts are hardened. It doesn't matter how far gone we are. It doesn't matter how angry with God that we are in this moment. It doesn't matter how much blame we're assigning to him right now. The Bible says that God can take hearts of stone and turn them into hearts of flesh. God can do that in our lives if we're willing to come back to him this morning. You are not too far gone, and God is still able to redeem you and redeem your trials and your tribulations. So I know we're going a little bit over this morning, but I am going to create space this morning 
for you and I to begin our comeback. We're going to sing a worship song. We're going to re-sing the song, Blessed Be Your Name. This is going to give us the opportunity right now from the message that we've heard with the focus on undeserved suffering is that if you and I are going through that right now, do we have the ability and do we have the faith to be able to stand up, lift our hands, and declare, God, you are good in the midst of what we're going through. So we're going to have an opportunity to do that as David leads us in that song. We're going to have an opportunity to mourn this morning. Our leadership team is going to make their way up to the front here. And if you know that you've been holding it in, you haven't been grieving this well, you haven't been honest about what's happening, I'm going to invite you to come up, meet with one of our leaders, and let them know what's going on to express that grief, to express that sorrow, and to allow them to pray with you. That's the second thing that we're going to be able to do. The third thing that we're going to be able to do in this moment as David leads us in the song is maybe you're saying, I... I'm blaming God a lot, and I need to stop that, and I need to repent from that. I'm going to invite you to come forward. You can kneel here at the altar. You don't need to meet with a leader if you don't want to, or if you want to meet with a leader, you can go forward and say, I need to repent from my blame for God, and I need to stop pointing the finger at him, and I need to start putting my eyes on him. The last one to discern, this is about us being able to leave the room today to go out and begin diving into scripture and beginning to know what the word of God has to say about life, about us, about sin, and just about things in general. Would you respond this morning in the way that is appropriate for you with wherever you're at? If you need to mourn, come forward and express that. If you need to worship, would you stand and lift your hands and extend as authentic and heartfelt of worship as you can to the Lord? And if you need to lay yourself down and stop blaming God, releasing control, and humbly coming back to him, would you do that this morning as well as David leads us?